I watched Disney's new live action Mulan and I just want to get out of the way the fact that I watched it like the weekend that it came out, like the day it came out. So like well before, I mean, okay, perhaps there were already some articles out about reasons to boycott it, reasons to not support it, reasons to not pay for it, etc. But I didn't see any of that <laughs> until after. So yeah, it is what it is. So. <laughs> I'm doing this review. Um, I don't think it's a good movie and I don't think it's worth paying for regardless of any other like moral, political, or any other reasons you might have for for avoiding it. I mean boycotting it makes it sound like a thing that you would want to do and you're choosing not to. You shouldn't want to is basically what I'm saying. So I guess you can take away from this video if you were feeling like you were missing out but you were really gonna like take one for the team because of the reasons people have for boycotting it. Um, don't be too broken up about it. You're not missing out. <laughs> I anticipate this being a very long video. Um, I watched the movie twice. This is the first time I watched it. I was just like watching it with my parents like the day it came out and we spent the whole time we were watching it being horrified and also laughing but like laughing at how bad it was <laughs> and at our own jokes at its expense. So when I decided that I wanted to review it, I knew I had to watch it again because there, there's like as the week went on there was just a lot of things about it that just started <laughs> melding into the vague haze of I hated it. So I wanted, there were things that I remembered specifically, like parts of it that I didn't like, but I didn't remember like all the specific reasons why it didn't work, just that it didn't. So I rewatched it last night. <laughs> it's fresh in my brain. And I took notes while I was watching it, which is like, this is more than I've really ever prepared for a video before. <laughs> I took notes while I was watching it. Basically took notes for every scene because there was something wrong with every scene. And this morning I combed through my pages and pages of notes and arrived at the, I started to see like a pattern, a theme for certain things that I was having problems with over and over and over again. So I began to group them into themes and topics <laughs> that were, anyway, I think that makes sense. I don't need to explain that. So yeah, instead of going scene by scene chronologically through the whole movie, because I could do that, just basically <laughs> from start to finish be like, scene one, all the things wrong with it. Scene two, all the things wrong with it. But I feel like that would be longer. And I just like it better to group it in themes because I feel like I'm going to go off on tangents if I do it the other way. Anyway, also I've gone to all the trouble and work of creating my list. So we're doing the list thing. <laughs> because I have a list. I think all the housekeeping is out of the way. I'm not here to talk about reasons to boycott it. I'm not here to talk about any of the political, larger than the movie, like real world things. It's not what this video is for. This is just a movie review. Mulan, let's do it. So first I'm gonna go over things that I liked and it's really short. So we're just gonna do this first and then we can be done with that. So things I liked about it, the costumes, the costumes are very cool. They, they were really nice. They had, rich jewel tones in the cloth there was you could tell there was a lot of detail in like embroidery and like the the armor they were wearing you could tell there was like a lot of detail and thought put behind it so it was they were really nice to look at and everybody looked good in them same goes for the set design and all the landscapes because I, I don't think you call it set design if it's a landscape but i mean all the shots of like mountains and forests and fields and the imperial city and inside the castle no it's not a palace palace right okay anyway all of the set designs and all of the locations were beautiful in general the movie was beautiful the costumes the actors in them the sets the places the, the locations it was a gorgeous film to look at like if you turned off your brain and turned off the sound and, and just looked at it it'd be a pretty postcard like the whole movie is a feast for the eyes uh, not enough to make me like it but it was very pretty. So people who were in charge of those things did a good job. And um, Cricket. Cricket is also on my list of things I hated, but the actor who played Cricket, who is not a Cricket, in the animated one, there is an actual Cricket, and he doesn't talk like Jiminy Cricket, but he's, you know, sort of anthropomorphized, and he's a character who's the lucky Cricket. And he's lucky because Mulan's grandma thinks he's lucky and gives him to Mulan to take with her. So since they didn't have any animal characters, any anything like that in this version, what they had was this character named Cricket. And it was unclear to me if his name is Cricket or if his nickname is Cricket. He just kind of introduces himself as Cricket and tells us, like the very first thing he does is tells us that he's Cricket and that his grandma thinks he's lucky or something like that. And I was just like, oh. This is still on the stuff I liked list, but just the actor who played Cricket, like if anyone else had played it, I would have thrown something, but the actor who played it was just so, like, a squishable ball of adorableness. He was like a human Olaf, and I just kind of wanted to give him a big hug. So when he said that he's lucky, 
I was just kind of like, oh, I hate this. I hate that someone wrote this, but oh, yeah, you're cute. <laughs> yeah, that does it for things that I liked. <laughs> so on to things that I hated or made no sense. And I have, did I really? I do. I have 10 things. And I mean, within each thing, there are things, but I have like 10 groupings of things. So I didn't actually plan like specifically to have 10. I just had 10. So it's meant to be. Number one, character motivations don't make sense or are inconsistent. And this version of Mulan um, is different from the live action one in not a lot of ways, but in a few key ways. One of those ways is um, the, the villains are different. So instead of it being just the Huns led by Shan Yu, who is intending to just take over more land, like he wants to expand his power, that's not the villain situation in the live action one. The live action one, you basically have two villains that are working together for the most part until they're not. This wasn't already clear, like major spoilers for the whole movie, so just FYI. So Bori Khan, who's the leader of the Roran army, and then working alongside him as his henchman. Um, you remember that hawk that Shan Yu has that's like on his shoulder and like sometimes like scouts around? Well, that hawk, sort of how like Nagini, we're talking about Harry Potter now, another taboo subject, but you know how Nagini was like actually a witch lady? Well, <laughs> the hawk is actually literally a witch lady and she is Bori Khan's like henchman. She's a witch that walks around and talks and, and I have a whole section devoted. I kind of have a whole section devoted to her. So yeah, she can turn into a bird. She can turn into many birds. She can like possess people's bodies. She can like wield her sleeves as weapons. Her hands turn into talons even when she's not a bird. She's uh, just a witch lady. And I, I'm not aware that she has a name. If she did have a name, like it went past me. So uh, I think most of the time people just kind of scream witch when she's around. So like, she's the witch lady. Anyway, so the motivations of the characters in this movie don't make sense. So it's very clear in the animated one that Sean Yu wants to just take over more area, more land, expand his power. And that's clear. <laughs> And like he views the Great Wall of China as like a personal challenge. <laughs> like they built the wall and Shan Yu was like, challenge accepted. I'm pretty sure in the movie at some point, he says that by building the wall, the emperor was inviting him. So it's it's not complex. It's very straightforward. And it's very, a, a very believable villain motivation. Because like throughout history, people have invaded places because they want more territory. So in this movie, Bori Khan, who is the leader of the Roran army, um, it's... It's told to us through other characters mentioning it, as well as Bori Khan telling us this, that the emperor, sometime before the movie started, killed Bori Khan's father, who was also called Bori Khan. Because when the emperor learns that Bori Khan is attacking, he's like, but I killed Bori Khan. And then someone's like, nah, nah, it's Bori Khan Jr. So Bori Khan wants revenge for the killing of his father. And he's he doesn't just hold the emperor responsible in like a general way. Like the emperor literally killed him, I guess. Like it's not clear how or why but he did. And it's also mentioned that the Roran lands were taken by the emperor at some point. So without historical context or anything, like I, I don't actually know that much about the history. So I don't know if in the original Mulan, like the, like the Huns invading is historically because their lands were taken by China, but that's never mentioned in the animated movie. It's just that China has these lands and the Huns want to invade. It's not ever like a, we want it back it's never said in the movie. So like as far as the audience is concerned, the Huns are just invading. In this movie, the Roran people who are not Bori Khan, they're they talk about how they lost their land. So I guess they would want their land back, except that's never the motivation for them invading. Bori Khan just keeps talking about how he wants revenge for his father's death. And then he's got like, uh, as they've been attacking the Silk Road villages, they've gathered um, gold and treasure and stuff. And Bori Khan is like, look at all this gold, you know, that I'll get for you. Look at this wealth. And the guys are like, we're nomads. Like, we don't, what's a nomad going to do with all this gold? And he's like, okay, well, then I can give you revenge for the land that was taken from us. So he's not saying let's get our land back. He said, let's get revenge. So I guess the plan is not to get their lands back. The plan is just to like stick it to China because they're pissed that China took their land. 
which paints China as the villain who like took over people's lands and kicked them off of them. So it's kind of hard to side with China in this war, but also what is this war for? Because it's not for territory. It's not Bori Khan trying to reclaim any particular area which used to be his land. He's just like trying to attack China to like get at the emperor and be like, I'm mad at you for killing my dad and taking my land. Like I don't want it back. But you know, it, it doesn't make sense why they would invade. It makes sense the Borycon would be pissed, but why would this army be invading? They're not trying to get anything, which just isn't how war works. In war, the sides are usually trying to achieve something, like land. <laughs> so the Roran plan for attacking China, this, what are their motivations? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, then moving into Mulan, her motivations are completely scattered throughout the movie and make no sense. She, at the beginning of the movie, is already like a super, like super big. <laughs> She's like doing parkour as a kid and like teaching herself katas that I'm like, if she's a girl not supposed to be learning this stuff, who is teaching her these forms? Like that's, you can be like a really agile child naturally, but you don't naturally do katas, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like those are specific forms for learning like body conditioning and how to fight. No, who, why would she be doing this if no one's teaching her? And if someone is teaching her, why are they teaching her? Because it's told to us that girls aren't supposed to do this. So like, and like her dad like has to tell her like, oh, you know, like I, like he doesn't want to crush her spirit, but he's like, you know, you're a girl. So like, cool it. Like, I, I love that you're like this, but the world won't. You're supposed to like get married and shit. So like, cool it on the being a badass thing. She kind of ignores her dad, but like, she's like, all right, yeah, I got it. And then when like, it's the same thing, like the dad's leg is like hurt. So then with this like call to like join the army to fight the Rorons who are attacking for some reason, she does do it to protect her father, but it's really not like, it doesn't feel like it's just that because she's, we, we have this extended intro showing us that she is a kind of a badass already. So her going isn't like, I have to do this because otherwise my dad will die. But I mean, like, this is not my area. It's totally her area. <laughs> so yes, it's to protect her father, but it also kind of just feels like a thing that she would have wanted to do regardless. And then it, later we get this narrative about how like society will never accept a woman being this way and how like, that's not a woman's place and how she needs to learn her place. But also like she wants everyone to know that she's a woman and that they should accept her as a woman being like this. So it's not even just about like what she wants to do and the fact that she happens to enjoy fighting more than embroidery or whatever. It's that women have a right to be here, I guess. But then later it becomes that her, her purpose that she states is her purpose is to protect the emperor. She's like, I know my place. My place is to protect the emperor. So her motivation is to protect the emperor but also to protect her father but to like stake her claim as a woman but like to just be herself and like it's just kind of all over the place like there's no great thesis to this like I just I don't really know what she's about uh it changes from scene to scene as the plot needs it to then the witch lady who I mentioned before who works with Bori Khan it's mentioned that like you know she was cast out of regular society because she's a witch and so Bori Khan took her in and he's kind of like he negs her a lot and it's like you know you were just like a stray whipped starving dog and I took you in and like and he basically tells all his because when his manners like but she's a witch she's like she knows who her master is and he's just like really aggro about it and you're like world's best boss you are not but so she's I guess fighting for Bori Khan like you could infer that it's because he took her in so she's kind of like paying him back for that being like well you know you gave me a place so like if your thing now is attacking China um I'm your girl Friday and I will help you attack China but then when she sees Mulan she's like girls don't have a place and girls have to like take their place and be badasses and like there's no place for us and we have to make our own place but don't you think I would have wanted a more noble path? But also that I can't have a more noble path. And she like tells Mulan to not have a noble path and to join her. But then is also like wanting to be like Mulan. And I'm like, are you pro Bori Khan? Or is he just like a friend of convenience because no one else would take you? It's very unclear if she feels actual loyalty for Bori Khan. Or she's just like, well, no one else would take me in. He did, but then as soon as it's convenient, she doesn't have loyalty for him anymore. I, I don't know. And then the commander who um, takes the, basically they split the character of Li Shang into two characters. There's like a love interest who's like in the army with Mulan, who's just like her equal. And then there's the commander who would have been Li Shang, but this is an older man who's not a love interest. And he's kind of all over the place because he's not actually in it that much. But like when 
it's like when it comes to like the Mulan as a woman, he instead of wanting instead of executing her, he banishes her, which is very clear in the animated movie why why Shang would do that because she just saved his life and he's like he literally says a life for a life. So it's not clear why this commander is willing to not kill Mulan because she kind of helped with the army, but she didn't really do anything specifically for him or like it's unclear if he even realizes that she helped him in battle. Like it's very unclear if he realizes that at all. So it's unclear why he would be lenient. But then later when she comes back to warn them again that the Rorons are attacking, he's immediately like, well, you're going to be executed now. And then like she explains why they need to listen to her. And like one minute later, he's like, your loyalty is beyond question and you will lead us. And I'm like, um, literally a minute ago, you were going to execute her. So like, I, I don't know where your head is at, sir. So yeah, that covers part one. Motivations don't make sense. That wasn't even my longest part. The longest part is the next part, which I'm about to go into. This is by far the longest and the, the, the part that I have the most to say about. So strap in. And that is the battle and war strategy that do not make any sense at all. I, it didn't make sense the first time I watched it. And upon rewatch, I was like, oh, it makes even less sense than I thought. If you've seen Mulan, it's kind of following the same plot again. So she like leaves home, joins the army, they're training for a bit, then they get called to action. And then they ride out and they find that this garrison has actually been killed. So then the, her battalion that she's a part of, they ride into this garrison, the fortress, and they go and they ride in there. So this is the setup for where they are. They're in this well fortified, well situated, easily defensible fortress. And someone rides in and tells them that Bori Khan's army is at about a day's ride away and that Bori Khan's forces vastly outnumber the forces that they have in the garrison. So some like extra in the background says fortify for siege. So we need to prepare to defend this fortress against siege, which is really the only option here. The only other thing that you would probably do is send out if you have other forces elsewhere, send out a rider to call for reinforcements, but you would be hunkering down and preparing for siege. Like that's really the only play here. <laughs> but no, the commander literally says no to the idea of preparing for siege. And I quote, he says, he who moves first controls the enemy. And everyone's just like, okay. So they ride out the next day to go fight Bori Khan where he is. Um, what? Why? Like, just who put this man in charge? You are outnumbered and you are currently in a very defensible position. And Bori Khan, like there's an, the messenger doesn't say that Bori Khan is about to attack a village. He doesn't say that Bori Khan is about to attack a city. It doesn't say that Bori Khan is about to do anything that you really need to go and stop him and be like, we got to leave the safety of this fortress to go and stop him. It's just that he is a day's ride away. Like that's where his forces currently are. So instead of staying in your fortress, which Bori Khan will presumably attack, you're riding out to meet him? No, that's, in fact, it's Bori Khan who has set the terms of this battle because he has more or less chosen the land on which they will fight. It's where his forces currently are. He's chosen the ground on which you're going to be fighting. So you have left your defensible position and you're letting Bori Khan choose the where you're going to fight. These are both really bad things for you. And you're outnumbered. So that's three against you. So there's just like, why on earth would you do that? Okay, so they get there. And I'm just gonna have to walk you through this because none of this makes sense. And as I walk you through it, it'll become clear why this makes no sense. Okay, so they ride, they get there, they march up and marred up and whatever. And Bori Khan's forces are coming towards them. And Bori Khan is like, oh, they've left their garrison, like bold move, but like doesn't matter. So Bori Khan and like a handful of his dudes, like not his whole army, just like a handful, like ride full force head on towards the China, towards China's army. And then decide he decides to do an about face and ride away. But so his army is coming towards them and Bori Khan has ridden ahead and then he turns around and then rides back this way as his army continues on. And the commander, whose bright idea it was to leave the garrison, he says, you know, oh, he's a coward and he's fleeing from battle. So he tells his left flank to, to pursue Bori Khan. Okay, so if you're China facing this, this oncoming army, the army's coming towards you, Bori Khan is gone here past his own army. Here's the Chinese army coming towards them, but the, the left flank is gonna pursue Bori Khan. Past Bori Khan's army that is approaching? And I, they just let them pass? Like the, the camera doesn't show what happens. They just kind of let them go, which makes zero sense. Like how did, how? <laughs> this oncoming army 
And they just rode right past them to follow Bori Khan. And the army's like, well, we're marching here, so you go do you, I guess. And this all happens really just so that we get Bori Khan out of the action and Mulan out of the action because she's in the left flank. So she was one of the party that's pursuing. And she kind of gets lost in the like this like mountain pass where she gets like this one-on-one with the witch lady. I'll touch on that later. This puts Mulan out of the action for a little bit. So then by the time Mulan comes back, again, I will unpack what Mulan did here in a different section. <laughs> when Mulan comes back to where the army, main army is fighting, the witch lady is is attached. She's turned herself into like a swarm of birds and and or bats or something like that. And she's like attacking the Chinese army. So the Chinese army, they put up like, they like cluster into like several clusters and put up their shields to like create a shield barrier, or shield wall to, to shelter under as the birds are attacking them. But by clustering, they're like making themselves like centralized targets for this swarm. And then while they're clustering and the swarm's attacking, at some point the Roran army get, got their trebuchets to the battle, which it makes sense that they would have had trebuchets with them if they were heading to the garrison where they would have expected to lay siege. <laughs> But, you know, before this commander decided to abandon the safety of his walls. So they would have had those along in order to attack the walls of that garrison, of that fortress. But they've brought them out now for this battle. I don't know who had time to go get them while they were battling. But they did, because Wulan gets back and they've got trebuchets now. And they are using these trebuchets to fire at these clusters of soldiers with, like, like laser precision. <laughs> they are attacking, like, there it's, like, a several clusters of, like, like, shield like little clusters of soldiers and they are attacking with trebuchets with like perfect accuracy where each hit hits one of these clusters and i'm just like that's not how trebuchets work <laughs> like they're designed to just kind of like you just like lob things at a wall during a siege you don't have to have like precision accuracy because you're just trying to take down the wall but apparently they have these really great aiming trebuchets and Mulan, no one notices, she's got time now to run around and collect a bunch of helmets from dead soldiers, I guess. And she runs around behind the Roran army. Behind them is a snowy mountain and some rocks. No one sees her doing this. She's wearing red and she's the swarm is leaving her alone and the trebuchets are leaving her alone. She just collects some helmets and scurries behind the Roran army where she puts the helmets on rocks. So it kind of looks like there's like dudes behind the rocks and she shoots her arrows at the Roran army like at, at their backs and they turn around and like see the helmets and they see her bow and arrow and they're like oh we're, for, we're at, for, uh, being attacked from behind so they turn around the trebuchet and aim it at her which that's not what trebuchets are for like they would just get their archers to try to like take out what archers they presume are hiding behind rocks on a mountain pass but no they turn around their trebuchet to try to hit her with it which again is not a sound strategy but they've lost their laser focused aiming capabilities because they miss her by a considerable distance like way off and they just hit the mountain behind her and cause the avalanche that we recognize from the animated movie because they're idiots and then she you know rides around and like she rescues not shang like the guy who's like the soldier counterpart of this Splitting of Shang. I don't know what his name was. I think they said it at some point. So she so she rescues not Shang just for nostalgia for the animated men. So after that, after the avalanche, then she like outs herself to the army. And yes, I, that's right. She outs herself, which we'll come back to. Don't worry, I have plenty to say about that. And they decide to not execute her, but to banish her. So she like goes to a mountaintop where she meets Witch Lady. And Witch Lady is like, join me. <laughs> Mulan negs her. She's like, you follow a coward. He like ran from battle. And the Witch Lady's like, uh-uh. Bori Khan actually, while y'all were battling, he's going to the to the Imperial City to kill the Emperor. So Mulan is just like, I don't want to join you. And leaves and the Witch Lady is fine with this. She doesn't try to kill her or stop her. Mulan leaves and goes back to that garrison, you know, the one that they left the safety of, to go tell them that Bori Khan is actually like the emperor's in danger because he's actually gonna attack the Imperial City. So this garrison, like, it's not like she reaches the outer wall of it and is like yelling up at them to listen to her and begging them to let her in and listen to her. No, she rides right in. No one stops her. She rides right in to where her old commander is. And he's like, what are you doing here? You're going to be executed. And I'm like, how did she get in here? 
Who? Why did no one stop her? Is no one guarding this place? Is that why you left? Because you were like, we don't guard our walls anyway, so why stay here? But anyway, so she's like, no, you have to listen to me because like, Bori Khan is actually gonna attack the emperor. And he's like doing that right now. Which again, like, I don't know why she believes the witch lady, but we'll come back to that, I guess. So now they're like, okay, we believe you and your loyalty is beyond question and we'll follow you. But like, instead of taking the whole garrison, in the whole battalion, who, what's left of them, they take like 10 dudes and say, okay, Mulan and these 10 dudes, you're now gonna go to the Imperial City to save the Emperor, which like, why only like 10 dudes? <laughs> but okay, so they do that. And meanwhile, in the Imperial City, the witch lady has taken the form of the Emperor's, um, some head dude who works for the Emperor. I forget what his title is. And this head dude is like, Bori Khan's men are here and Bori Khan is offering a duel like you and him, mano a mano, instead of having the armies keep fighting. The emperor is like, my people have suffered enough. And so he's agreed to it. Like, because Bori Khan asked? Like, he's not laying siege to the imperial city. It's not like it's like this or nothing. Like, he, there's no imminent danger. As far as they know, they defeated Bori Khan on the battlefield. So why is the emperor agreeing to this? But the emperor agrees to this and he leaves the safety of the imperial city to ride out and meet Bori Khan. <laughs> because we all like leaving the safety of our fortresses for some reason. So he rides out to meet Borikon and then he goes to where Borikon wants to meet him where this like new palace is under construction. So it's all like scaffolding or there's like tons of like bric-a-brac that someone could hide behind to like ambush you. And surprise, Borikon's men ambush the emperor and he's like, what? Like, who made you emperor? How are you this dumb? He gets ambushed and he's like, you know, Bori Khan's like, oh, you couldn't have expected a fair fight. And like, the emperor says to me, like, how did you get my, like, dude to betray me? And I'm like, in what way? Like, I know the witch lady was impersonating that dude, but also in what way was that dude betraying you? You betrayed yourself. He just said, hey, Bori Khan's here and offering a, to fight you in a duel. There's not really a betrayal there. It's really still a message. Like, the witch lady could have, like, said it herself. All he did or she, as he, did was say, hey, Borikon wants to do a duel, and you agreed to it. So don't, don't blame witch lady, don't blame your servant. This was your bad decision. Okay, and so then the emperor starts, like, fighting Borikon, but of course he loses because, like, Borikon's forces are all ambushing them. So then meanwhile, like, Mulan and her, like, handful of dudes have infiltrated the Imperial City and are like, where are all the guards? And they, like, you know, find where they're all clustered and, like, fight Borikon's men. And she gets to the throne room where the witch lady is. And the witch lady is like, I can't believe you're leading a man's army. And she's like, yeah, you said I couldn't be like I did. So girl power. And the witch lady is like, mm, and like turns into a hawk and flies out. And Mulan is like, she wants me to follow. Like, I don't, I wasn't picking up that message. It was just like, she's just leaving. But Mulan scrambles about on rooftops to follow a flying hawk, which I don't care how badass you are at parkour. You cannot follow a flying hawk by running after it along rooftops, but she does. <laughs> and the hawk flies to the scaffolding where the emperor currently is. So I guess the witch lady did want Mulan to follow her. And, um, but obviously the hawk gets there first cause it can fly faster. And the witch lady basically, like, I'm not sure Bori Khan would have noticed Mulan approaching if the witch lady hadn't come and flown in and been like, there's the woman leading the forces in the Imperial city. And he's like, a woman and then he like looks behind the witch and sees Mulan coming and I'm like wait give her away whose side are you on? Coming as a huge surprise to literally no one, Bori Khan pulls out a bow and arrow and tries to shoot Mulan down as you would expect and the witch lady's like oh fuck yeah oh fuck so she turns to a hawk and flies in front of the arrow so it shoots her instead of Mulan and she like flutters down and turns back into a lady and like Mulan cradles her dying body in her arms. Meanwhile, no other arrows are shot their way. Which, which lady has time to die beautifully in Mulan's arms? Meanwhile, Bori Khan is not trying to shoot her again. <laughs> I don't know why. Because she's literally sitting there like in open ground, just cradling a dying body. And Bori Khan decided to be like, ah, well, whatever, doesn't matter. She's too sad now, she won't, f I don't fucking know. So Mulan leaves the dead witch now and like enters the scaffolding where she has like the most absurdly choreographed fight with Bori Khan. And then they like, they're hanging from this, they're like standing on this beam that's hanging from like a crane from the sky. Like, I don't know where this is supposed to be hanging from or what the purpose of this is other than to have this fight scene, but they're like on this beam and fighting. And this really thick rope is like holding this beam up in midair. 
And then she gets Borikon's sword away from him because she loses hers. And with one slash cuts through this thick ass rope, which like, that's not believable. And like grabs onto the rope herself as Borikon presumably falls to his death. Or does he? <laughs> because on the ground now, he like perks up while Mulan is untying the emperor at the top of the scaffolding. And he's got his bow and arrows on him still, I guess, or he's got them near, I don't know, but he gets a bow and arrow and he shoots up at the emperor. But Mulan freed the Emperor's hand just in time for him to catch the arrow that would have killed him, which is a thing people can do. And then the Emperor, like, gives a knowing nod to Mulan, which she understands means that he's gonna serve the arrow midair like a fucking birdie in badminton. And this is a thing Mulan did earlier in the movie, so it's been set up and it's it's stupid the first time she does it, it's even stupider here. She leaps into midair, repels off a beam, and like kicks the arrow into Borokan's chest. And the part of this that is unbelievable, I mean, obviously kicking the arrow is unbelievable, but she's that's been set up in the movie that she can do this, that she can kick things in midair and aim them, like, which is dumb, but okay, like we've accepted this is a skill she has. But she's kicked it in like midair in the scaffolding which I played it back like three times because it hits Borikon sure enough and now he's really dead. But the next shot of her, she's just standing next to the emperor again, like fine. And I'm like, you just leapt into midair. How did, how did you not fall down to your death now? Like I've accepted you kicked the arrow and apparently you can do that, but she leapt into midair. And the next shot, she's standing next to the emperor, just fine. How did you get there? <laughs> Part three is chi. What the fuck is chi? So this is a new concept that's introduced in this movie. It's not in the original animated one. There's this thing called chi. It's a little bit played like the force, but it's so unclear. Like I wrote down every time it's mentioned, trying to figure out what the fuck chi is. They describe it kind of as being something that's innately in each person, kind of like a soul. But it's also a thing they, they say that the chi is strong in you. So I guess it's like your life force. And then, uh, then she can also be wielded. So that's what makes it kind of like the force, but it's also just for dudes, not for women. So I guess not everybody has a life force if that's what she is. But so we're told in the beginning that Mulan is strong with her chi or her chi is strong or both or whatever, however, whichever way it works. And that's why she's so good at fighting and parkour and like knows all of this magic stuff. And I say magic specifically because it's also explained that the reason that the witch lady is a witch lady is because she also is a strong wielder of chi. And in women, chi manifests itself as as witchery. But Mulan never does it. I mean, she just, she kicks arrows in midair, which is like unbelievable, but it's not magic in the way of like turning into a hawk <laughs> is magic. So it's told to us that the reason the witch can do this is because she's a woman using chi. Using chi, not channeling it. Like it's a thing she's using externally, not that's already in her. It's so unclear. And that everyone's kind of afraid. That's why Mulan is told to like chill on the whole fighting thing because people are gonna think she's a witch. And so at no point in the movie does she ever do any magic. And I, my question is, is is she eventually going to do magic? Like if she, you let her finally like unleash her chi, is she going to be turning into a hawk at some point? <laughs> like is, throughout the movie, she's just really good at fighting. Unbelievably good at fighting and parkour. But she's never doing magic stuff. So like, why is it a magic thing at all in women? Like, wouldn't it just be... It makes more sense for the way that Mulan is using chi, where it's just like, oh, well, chi is like this like warrior spirit. So like she's, it's not expected for women to do it because that's a thing men do. So the Mulan's relationship with it makes sense if the witch lady wasn't in it, but the witch lady is in it. And the witch lady is a witch because of the chi, which is not how Mulan is using chi. I'm so confused. Also, okay, so like I said, chi is for warriors, not daughters. So like, okay, yeah, it's like a dude thing. And if women use it, it's bad because they turn into witches, okay? But, also, also, like, okay, they literally say the phrase, chi is for warriors, not daughters. Um, cut to someone saying that the witch lady is strong with chi, and the, some servant of the emperor saying, and I quote, it is forbidden to use chi in destructive ways. But I'm, I'm pretty sure chi was for warriors. <laughs> so he doesn't say it's forbidden for women to use chi in destructive ways or for chi to be used in destructive ways by women. He just says it's forbidden to use chi in destructive ways. But you also literally the purpose of chi is to strengthen warriors, not daughters, which warriors, I think, are pretty destructive. 
I don't know. What the fuck is Chi? What is Chi? And why is Chi? And who put this in this movie? It helps nothing. It's just so confusing. Number four, song lyrics as dialogue. So there's no music in this movie. I mean, there's a score, like, you know, there's like orchestral music in the background, which is fine. Like, and they use some like um, melodies that are like recognizable here and there where you're just like, oh, that sounds like reflection or oh, that sounds a little bit like make a man out of you. But they take lyrics from songs and make them dialogue. It's, and it's cringy every single time they do it. It doesn't fit the scene. It doesn't fit the character. And the only purpose of it is to be a callback, a callback that just reminds you of the fact that aren't, there aren't any cool songs in this movie. And it just makes you upset because it doesn't improve the movie. It just reminds you of a better movie and reminds you how shit this one is. So instances where this is used that I wrote down, I think it's done a few more times, but these are the ones that I wrote down. Towards the beginning of the movie, when like Mulan's gonna go to the matchmaker and she's been told this is her place, she doesn't say, you know, like, yes, I accept this is my place and like, I'll do my part or like, I'll do what is expected of me. She says, I will bring honor to us all. Like, it's just a weird way to phrase it. If you didn't know that was a song lyric, you'd be like, why are you saying you're gonna bring honor to us all? Like, wouldn't you just say like, it would be my honor to like do this for the family or whatever. You know, it's just, it sounds so odd. And it sounds doubly odd because you're like, that's that should be sung there's twice for the commander because they don't have the cool fighting montage of i'll make a man out of you they just have like the beginning of training where the commander says we're gonna make men out of every single one of you and i'm like that it sounds weird it, it fits the song because it's a song and because you know that mulan is like a girl but when it's just like the silent army listening to a commander who's like giving them their like speech. It sounds really weird for him to be like, you know, we fight for China and I'm going to make, we're going to make a man out of every single one of you. Like it would make more sense if he'd say, we're going to make warriors out of every single one of you. But nope, <laughs> so that's, I'm going to make a man out of you. And then later when the commander is talking to Mulan about how strong her chi is and how like how that chi is and should be and how he recognizes it in her. He says that it's tranquil as a forest, but on fire within, which is literally from Make a Man Out of You. And <laughs> because it's so recognizable, like that's, it sounds silly. And if you didn't know it was from a song, you'd just be like, I don't know that that fits what we're talking about right now, but okay. It's just, why? It didn't help the movie. It just, it was so dumb. Number five, the movie is narrated by the father. Which makes no sense to me because this whole movie, even though it utterly failed its in its endeavor to be this empowering movie for women in general and for Mulan specifically, having it narrated by the dad, in what way is that in keeping with the girl power message of this movie? Also, the dad is the worst possible narrator for this movie because he is absent from most of the action of the movie. So I think you would want a firsthand account of the events of a movie from people who saw it and felt it and knew about it. At best, he heard about this from Mulan. So why can't she fucking narrate it? <laughs> because it's her story. Or like, have a voiceover that's like, it would be corny as fuck, but if it was like a female voiceover and you find out later it's Mulan's daughter hearing, like telling the story of the legend that was her mother, but it's the dad. And there's so many instances where it doesn't make any sense why he'd be the one, like his voice is piped in at the randomest times where it's something that like, it's not even, it's like a really internal thing that he really wouldn't know unless Mulan told him. So like when they, she finally gets to the, to the army camp campment to like join them and to start training, his voiceover comes in to tell us that like, oh, you know, she was scared because she'd never, she didn't really know the world of men because he protected her from it. And like, she knew she had to fit in and find a way to be a part of this. And like, but she was, you know, how she was feeling about it. And I was like, did she specifically tell you when she got back? She's like, man, you know, when I got there, you know, like I was like so scared because of like, you know, like why would he know how she's feeling? And then when the witch lady has her one-on-one -on -one with Mulan after she's like gone the left flank to pursue Bori Khan and he disappears and she has her one-on-one -on -one now with the witch lady, the witch lady's like, you're a liar, you're not a man, you're a woman. And Mulan keeps insisting that, you know, she's a, a man. And the witch lady is like, well, then you're gonna die pretending to be something you're not. And she throws a throwing star at Mulan, which hits her in the chest. And then the witch lady leaves. And then Mulan is on the ground, like, you know, down for the count. But then she like, the voiceover comes in and it's her dad being like, you know, but Wajun, which is her boy name, he died because a lie can only live so long but Mulan lived and it's like her being reborn as herself. And I'm like, why would her dad know? 
about this. It's a really weird time for him to like chime in. Yeah, the dad's voice there is just like, why are you telling me about this? Like he tells us at the end that like, that she became a hero, a leader who became a hero who became a legend. I'm like, buddy, you're considerably older than Mulan. Most people don't live to see themselves become a legend. It's even more unlikely that you lived to see her become a legend. I'm, I don't think you know that she became a legend. <laughs> Which is why, again, it would make more sense at the end if it was like Mulan's daughter or something that was just like, you know, and she became a legend and then she became my mother or some bullshit like that. Like, it would still be corny as fuck, but it would be better than the dad narrating it because I'm just like, why? Number six is the phoenix. <laughs> so instead of Mushu as the family guardian that's, that they're sending, the ancestor's guardian or whatever, that they're gonna send after Mulan to help. Instead of giving us Mushu, or then being like, we're just not gonna have that. Nope, we got a phoenix. And the phoenix is set up in the beginning because there's like a statue of a phoenix in their village. And then the dad, before he's heading out, thinks he's heading out to battle. He's like polishing his, like sharpening his sword. And he's got this like little medallion that's of a phoenix. And he's like, she's followed me into battle before and she will follow me again. And you're just like, did she help you in battle? Like in what way is this a good thing? And so then Mulan, when she leaves um, and she gets like lost in the desert before finding the army encampment, and the only purpose of her getting lost is so that the phoenix can show up like a fucking kite. Like it looks literally like a rogue kite that got like got parted from its string and it's just like floating around. Like it does not look magical. <laughs> it looks like a fucking kite. And it just shows up because Mulan doesn't know which way to go. And she's like run out of food and water. And she's like, the phoenix. And it's just like flying around being like this way and gets her to the army encampment. So like you could just cut that whole scene because like, I don't know why she would get lost on her way to the army encampment. And the only reason we had that scene is so the phoenix could show up and be like this way. But you just cut that whole thing out. It makes a little, like absolutely no difference to the plot. And then later when Mulan is fighting Bori Khan uh, herself to defend the emperor, the when she loses her sword, the emperor says something about how like, you know, a phoenix rises from the ashes. And she's like, yeah. And the phoenix literally shows up and then flies behind her. And then she like rises up and it's like literally Daenerys Targaryen 2.0 where like the phoenix wings are behind her and she's like the phoenix. And I was just like, what? You still don't have a sword. Like, in what way was this helpful? The phoenix showed up to like get you a cool selfie. Like, how is this helpful? Thanks, ancestors. Mushu was much more helpful. And then at the end, then the dad says something about how like the phoenix is gonna tell the ancestors that she was like so great. And I'm like, so is the phoenix just like spying and it's gonna report back to the ancestors and be like, yeah, she did good. I saw it. He plus. What was the fucking point of a fucking phoenix? It didn't do shit. It didn't help her at all. It was, and it didn't look magical. It was the dumbest shit. Like just fucking cut it out. Number seven, empowering moments. There's several moments in the original movie that are really empowering moments. And this movie either changed them in a way that made them not empowering or replaced them with something that was less empowering. The part where Mulan has decided to take her father's place and now go to the army in his place. In the animated movie, it's this epic montage where she like sees that her dad is like stumbling and it's just like, like she's no warrior, but she's young and, and she's in better shape than dad. So, you know, she like finds his armor, takes his sword, cuts her hair, prays to the ancestors. And like, it's like a big deal. And it's built up that way. In this movie, Mulan just kind of like gets the armor and leaves. <laughs> like they just like cut to her already wearing it. And she like says a quick prayer to the ancestors and leaves. She doesn't cut her hair because we couldn't have her later fighting with hair flowing in the wind if she did that, which is again, less empowering or er, it's less of like a, you know, there's no going back. Like I'm really committing to this decision plus cutting your hair with a sword. I mean, like there's nothing more epic than that. There's like no like decision montage, which is just such a turning point in the animated movie where she's like, I'm doing this. And this one, she's already been kind of fighting and already been kind of like into the whole fighting and acrobatics thing. So her deciding to go, it just kind of feels like the natural progression of things. It doesn't feel like oh fuck, you're deciding to do this thing. It's just like, yeah, well, I guess, I mean, you would, wouldn't you? Like you're already kind of fighting all the time anyway. And yeah, there's the armor and, uh, and off you go. So it didn't feel, I didn't feel anything. And then in their training, um, it's a big thing during the song and the animated one. And it's a thing that they're trying to do is there's an arrow that Shang shoots to the top of this like really tall beam, this really tall pole. And then he has these like really heavy medallions that they have to hold and they're told that they have to carry these medallions while they climb the pole and retrieve the arrow. And none of them can do it because the medallions are really heavy and everyone keeps failing at it, not just Mulan. And then 
at the end of the montage, you know, she like figures out a way to like use the medallions instead of like making them weigh her down. She's, she's clever and she figures out a way to make the medallions help her to climb the, the pole and retrieve the arrow, which shows that she's smart, that she's adapting and she's clever. In this movie, Mulan's like during training just keeps trying to hide how badass she is. She's not trying to become badass. She already knows how to fight. So it's not like her watching her trying to become a fighter, which she isn't. She already is one. So you're just like, okay. And instead of a, a pole that you have to climb to retrieve an arrow, there's just like for this really tall hill mountain thing with stairs and everybody has to carry two buckets of water with their arms like completely outstretched on either side holding the bucket of water the whole way up and everyone's failing at it because buckets of water are heavy so it says test of endurance and Mulan does it and it's just like for one it's completely unbelievable because this actress built no muscle <laughs> she like it's just it's unbelievable because it, it's it's not cleverness it's not agility it's not adaptability it's literally a test of physical strength. That's all that that is. And she's, it's not believable that she is strong enough to do this. And then even her proving that she does it, it just shows that I guess she's got muscle. Like it doesn't show that she's clever or adaptable or anything like that. So when she reaches the summit of the mountain, you're just like, okay, good job, I guess. Yay. <laughs> Like it doesn't, you know, it doesn't feel like anything. It doesn't feel earned. And then when they decided to leave the garrison and now go attack Borikon, so the eve of battle before that, all the dudes are like, oh my god, like we're actually going to battle, like we're gonna die maybe. And Mulan, and her little pep talk to them is, we'll all live. I guarantee it. She says, I guarantee it. Like what are those men's warehouse? <laughs> you're gonna like the way you fight. I guarantee it. And she's like, no, because I'll protect you. And you're just like, it's not a good pep talk. It's it's dumb. So then when she meets up with Witch Lady and her little one-on-one -on, -one on the battlefield after she's separated from everybody and the lady's like, you know, you're going to die as pretending you're something you're not. And throws the throwing star at Mulan that takes her down and dad's voiceover says, you know, but Mulan lived. And as she stands up and like she discovers that the throwing star, it hit her right here where she's been binding her breasts. So she's got this like thick cloth here that kind of caught it. And protected her from the brunt of it. Not her armor, but the cloth she was using to bind her breasts. So she takes out the throwing star and she's like shaking it off. And like the message I got from that was the lie saved your life. If you hadn't been binding your breasts, you would be dead. But her le the lesson she takes from this is I should listen to my enemy who couldn't possibly have ulterior motives for, for telling me to out myself. She seems to have my best interests at heart and I can't live a lie. So on her way back to the battlefield, she takes off her helmet, takes down her hair, takes off her armor, which she just like discards along the path. Like she doesn't even take it with her, which is her dad's armor, may I remind you. So it's like disrespectful to your dad. It's a really poor decision because like, I'm, even women need armor. <laughs> it's like, this is not the time for this, honey. Out yourself later. But when women go to battle, they wear armor. You need it. But she sheds her armor and rides into battle with her hair flowing in the wind because she's going to fight us herself, unleashed. And it makes some sense that armor would be constricting to your movement. So she's able to move more freely and fight more in her style when she doesn't have armor. But the only part of her armor that she leaves on is the armor that's uh, covering her thighs, which is the part that I would imagine be the most like cumbersome and most in the way of your her free movement. So if, like keep your helmet on, you know, keep this part on. That's the part you really need to protect. And then you can take the armor off of your legs. That's the part that like, if you're going to take any armor off, take the armor off of your thighs because a, an injury to your thigh, while it could possibly get infected and it will hinder your ability to move, it won't be a mortal wound. But that's the part she leaves armor on because it looks cool. <laughs> it's just, it's not empowering. It's dumb. It makes her look like an idiot. And it's also, it's just altogether a really poor decision. And she did it on the advice of her enemy, which is always a great idea. If your enemy tells you to do something, don't question it. Just do it. And so then after the battle, because like in the middle of the battle, no one notices her. It's only the audience that sees her being a badass. So then after the battle's over and she's saved not Shang, she saves not Shang, but she like leaves him unconscious, kind of like Ariel in Little Mermaid. So he doesn't see that she saved him. She walks away and you're like, okay, well, she's trying to get the fuck out of there so that no one sees that she's a woman, even though she's chosen to out herself. 
So she wants him to know, but right now she doesn't. So she leaves and you're like, I guess that's why she left. Except one second later, he comes back to the army and they're like, have you seen Wajun? And he's like, no, I haven't seen Wajun because he doesn't know that Wajun saved him. And then out of the fog and mist, Mulan walks up and she's like, I'm Gua Mulan. So she is outing herself. So why didn't you stay by not Shang so that at least you'd get credit for saving his life if people are going to be like, you're a girl, you should die. I'd be like, but I just saved him. And he can be like, yeah, she did just save me. Nope, you just left his body, walked away, like circled the block and then was like, I'm Mulan, why? So she outs herself. It's not like her helmet fell off during battle and like they saw her hair and they're like, you're a girl. She just walks up, she's just like, uh, decided that you should know that I'm a girl. And they're like, uh, okay, you're banished then because that's, you brought dishonor and disgrace upon us by your, by lying to us. I'm like, you brought dishonor and disgrace to this army by being a fucking dumbass. But since your commander decided to leave the garrison, I guess you're in good company. You know, what, what can we possibly expect? He's for, decided to be lenient, which again, in the original, it makes sense because she just saved Shang's life. And he's like a life for a life, which is while sad, it is kind of an empowering moment because she has at least earned Shang's respect enough to where he kind of disgusted, but it's also this kind of like this mutual respect that keeps him from killing her. So like he's, it's sad, but it is empowering in a way in the animated one. But here, this commander is just like, well, you're banished. <laughs> and Mulan <laughs> says that she'd rather be executed. And I was like, girl, why? Was outing yourself like a, an elaborate attempt at suicide? Like you outed yourself because you were hoping that they would kill you? What? I, I, what? Why? I almost put this in the motivations don't make sense part, but like, I knew you had to explain too much about how we got to this point. <laughs> why? And they refuse. She's like, I'd rather be executed. And they're like, okay, well, if you come back again, your wish will be granted. <laughs> and I want to be like, if I was, if I seriously would rather be executed, I'd be like, so if I just circle the block and come back, you'll execute me? Great. Be back in a sec. You know, like, she just said she wanted to be executed. And your threat is, well, if you come back, you will be. <laughs> She's like, but I literally just said I wanted that, so... <laughs> what? And then when she comes back to tell them that Warikan's actually fighting, uh, going to attack the, the Emperor, um, and the commander is like, you're going to be executed now. She's like, no, listen to me. He's going to... We have to go defend the Emperor. And he's like, your loyalty is beyond question. You will lead us. And I'm like, it's not earned. It's so random that the commander is all of a sudden like, you're going to lead us. When one second ago you were going to execute her. It's... It's not like he's gradually seen that she's proven herself in battle and proven herself as a leader. And he's like, finally, like, you should lead us. It's like a split second. So it's not empowering because you were gonna kill her until not Shang piped up and was like, well, you trusted Wa Jun. Why wouldn't you trust Wa Mulan? And he's like, good point. You lead us. And I'm like, Who put this man in charge? <laughs> I don't understand. Okay, part eight. Trusting the witch lady too much. This, I have... There's three separate occasions that Mulan just takes the witch's word for something. And I, I don't understand why. So the first is that when she meets her one-on-one -on -one and the, the witch is like, you know, telling her to out herself and that like she's going to die, pretending to be something she's not. Um, and she tells her, which I didn't mention before, she says, pretending to be a man is smothering her chi. Uh, and which lady would know? Because I mean, she's turning into a hawk and shit. So this lady knows about chi. And Mulan is just like... No. But then we just we see her decide that, yeah, the witch lady threw a throwing star at me and tried to kill me. And if I wasn't wearing armor and I wasn't wearing the stuff binding my breasts, she would have succeeded. But I should, uh, I should out myself. She's right. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you take her word for it that it, it's smothering your chi? Like, it seems to me that your enemy only stands to gain from you being dumb enough to take your armor off. So... Why wouldn't you just say whatever the fuck she needs to to get you to do that? Like, if I was the witch, I'd be like, uh, yeah, take off your armor, because, um, you'll fight so much better without it, trust me. Oh, I can't believe you just did it, great, I'm gonna kill you now. <laughs> like, why would you believe her? And then when, again, after the battle, when she's, like, now been banished, and she meets up with the witch lady, and the witch lady's like, merge your path with mine, and, like, grow in your chi, blah, blah, blah. When Wulan's like, oh, but, you know, you follow a coward, and the witch lady is like, Khan is going to attack the, the emperor right now. Like, the witch lady is a real idiot for telling Mulan this if it's true. The only way it's smart for her to do this is if she's telling Mulan this because Mulan has proved herself to be a dum-dum 
And she's like, Mulan will believe literally anything I tell her. Like, I've seen it. So I'm going to tell her that Bori Khan's attacking the Imperial City. And I bet she'll swallow it. And, you know, on the off chance that she convinces her men that this is what's going on, like, for whatever ulterior motive I find. Like, it seems to me that she would only say this if it's not true. But Mulan does not verify this in any way. She cannot verify this in any way. And she immediately rides back to the garrison and is like, well, you have to go to the Imperial City because Bori Khan's attacking the Emperor. And, like... I mean, it proves to be true, but it seems to me that why would you take the witch's word for it? At best, Mulan could write it back and be like, I don't know if this is true, and I don't know if we want to take the chance, but I thought you should know that the witch lady told me that this is happening, and you decide from there. But she's just like, I know it's happening. And in the animated one, Mulan literally herself sees Shan Yu emerge from the avalanche with his men and go to attack the emperor. So she's seen it. She knows it's happening. In this movie, the witch lady's like, tells her. And Mulan's like, that must be true. Why would she lie to me? <laughs> like, for many reasons. So she takes her word for it. And then at the end, when the, the witch lady turns into a hawk and Mulan's like, oh, she wants me to follow her. I'm like, to a trap, maybe? <laughs> I mean, I guess twice in a row now, like, you've believed the witch. And to my great astonishment, it has paid off. But if the it's just flying away, I wouldn't immediately be like, oh, she's leading me to the emperor so that I can save him because I can trust her. Um, I'd be like, maybe she's leading me into a trap slash I cannot possibly follow a bird that's flying. So I guess I'll never know where she's flying to because like, <laughs> that's impossible. But nope, she's just like, she's leading me and I should follow. Okie doke. Part nine, the ending of the movie. Oh my god, okay. So after Bori Khan dies, Mulan has a moment to be alone with the emperor. And he's like, you know, who is this woman that saved my life and whatever. So they have like time to like talk one on one. But we cut away from that. And the next shot we see is reminiscent of the animated one, where now all of China has had time to prepare this huge festival in the Imperial City. There's fireworks, there's dragons, everybody's like wearing their finest. There's like this everybody's back in the Imperial City and like the, the throne room is like filled with like his armed guards and the actress who originally gave the voice of the animated Mulan leads new Mulan down the aisle like a fucking wedding but Mulan is still wearing what she was wearing when she fought Bori Khan so I guess no one thought she should get a change of clothes even though they've had time to prepare this great ceremony so presumably time has passed at least a day so she comes down the aisle and follows real Mulan <laughs> and the emperor in front of everybody offers her a position in his guard and Mulan has waited until this moment to, to reject the offer. And I'm like, they were presumably preparing this ceremony for a while. And I don't think you were walking down the aisle not knowing what is about to be offered to you because you weren't, it, it doesn't seem like a hostage situation where you're just like being told to go down the aisle. It's just like, but why? Like she seems to know what's going on, but she decided to wait until that moment to humiliate the emperor. when he's like, you, I want to honor you and thank you for what you've done. You know, you giving you a place in my guard. And she's just like, no, nah, I have to go home to my family. <laughs> if I was the emperor, I'd be like, now you tell me? Like, you could have fucking mentioned that you were gonna say no. In the animated one, it's already a festival that Sean Yu has crashed. So they've like, saved the ch saved china during the festival so it's during the festival that the emperor can be like wow you just saved my life okay well um do you want a position in my guard and mulan right then and there is just like oh man i gotta go home but here time has passed so like they had to put together this ceremony and she waited either the emperor waited to ask her and decided like i'm just gonna put this whole ceremony together no way she's gonna say no it's like one of those like elaborate engagements. Like I always think about that. You know, someone's planning this elaborate like beachside engagement with like secret photographers. Like what? She says no. Because it's like Mulan literally was just like, no, nah, I'm going to go home. And she's like, okay, well, devotion to family is like A plus two. So playing it off like, oh, it's cool. So she goes home. And when she gets home, oh yeah, I didn't even mention Mulan has a sister in this, but it's like completely irrelevant. She's just there to be like a counterpoint to Mulan to be like, well, this is what a real girl should be like. She likes girly things and she's afraid of spiders. And the first thing that her sister tells her is that, that she's been matched and that, you know, her boo is not afraid of spiders. <laughs> like, yay. Can't wait for the part where Mulan tells her parents that like, okay, so the emperor was going to give me a job, but I thought you guys would like to shelter and clothe me for a few more years. So I said, no, you're welcome. But no. So she comes home and she's like, you know, I stole your armor and I rode off and I'm so sorry. And then her dad is just like, no, like, you know, having you for a daughter or whatever is the greatest thing. He also says to her that my foolish pride drove you away. And I'm like, what movie did you watch, sir? Because it wasn't your foolish pride that drove her away. She didn't leave 
during a tantrum because you guys were arguing. She left because she was trying to protect you because you're going to die if you went and fought in the army. So are you saying you were too prideful to say I like, can't fight? So I'm pretty sure it was not optional. It was a draft. So that line just makes no sense. But he says it and she's just like, yeah. <laughs> and then the guards show up again to like present Mulan with a sword and in front of the village now and to renew the job offer because <laughs> she said no the first time and she like gets this sword and she still doesn't actually say yes i guess it's assumed that she probably would but she like reads the sword and the like added a devotion to family like inscription on it and then the voiceover the dad tells us that she became a legend and i'm just like what <laughs> what was any of that okay and section 10 is just random miscellaneous stuff that i just like thought was funny or stupid that didn't really fit any of the other themes they were just like random one-off little things that i was just like that's dumb so spiders is one of them like it's a big thing that the sister's afraid of spiders like the part in the animated one where mulan fucks up with the matchmaker is because of the cricket but here it's because there's a spider that like because the sister's also there for some reason and the spider shows up and mulan tries to kill the spider with the teapot and it's unsuccessful and it's like a whole thing and it's just like really dumb <laughs> because like it's very clear to like it's in the animated one the matchmaker doesn't know that there's a cricket she just thinks mulan is like acting a fool <laughs> but here everybody clearly sees the spider and knows that mulan's trying to kill it but then the matchmaker is still like you're a disgrace <laughs> and i'm like but why though when mulan is getting ready to go to the matchmaker she they do the whole montage of her like getting dressed and like that you can hear the music is like the bring honor to us all song and she's this beautiful like sash and her hair is up and they paint her face all white with the lipstick and the whatever and then on their way to the matchmaker Mulan turns to her sister and just like you know talking about how what her facial expression is and like can you tell what I'm feeling right now and the sister's like no and Mulan's like this is my angry face this is my sad face this is my confused face making a joke about how she can't move her face like it's Botox or something like she's wearing a lot of makeup but it's not Botox she's acting like she can't move her face so I, that just didn't make any sense. I was like, it's a lot of makeup, but you can move your face. <laughs> um, then when the dad is like, gonna go to the army and they have like the family dinner where like Mulan's like, you shouldn't have to go. And he's like, it's my place to go. And he like leaves the dinner table. And the mom's like, he will not return this time. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, mom. I mean, that's a little early to be writing him off as dead. Like, can, can we chill on that? Like, it's very possible he'll die, but come on, mom. <laughs> Come on. Um, then Mulan binds her breasts outside of her shirt. And like in this version, she doesn't have her own private tent to sleep in when she's with the army. She's in a big tent with everybody else. And she keeps unbinding and binding and binding, unbinding and binding her breasts at night. But she has the wrappings outside her shirt where it's more likely that somebody's going to catch sight of it. I just don't understand that. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you put the bindings under your shirt where people are less likely to see it? And then, uh, yeah, Cricket, I, that was dumb. <laughs> That was so dumb that like they turned Cricket into a human. Like when I saw they did that, I was like, oh God, is there going to also be a human named Mushu? I will die. There wasn't. We had the fucking phoenix. You decided not to have like fun animal creatures in it. So why make a human be Cricket? That's so dumb. Oh, and then like a little thing, like I'm pretty sure Not Chang, he has to be gay because so he like finds Mulan when he still thinks it's Wajun. And the dudes have just been talking about like what their perfect woman is because it's a callback to the song, Oh Girl Worth Fighting For, which is so dumb. And it's obviously a callback to that because they, oh, I didn't write that down. That's another song lyric they use where he says like, it doesn't matter what she looks like. It only matters what she cooks like. And I was like, so from the song. <laughs> anyway, so uh, Not Shang finds Mulan and he's like, are you matched, Wajun? And Mulan's like, no. <laughs> and he, Not Shang is like, oh, lucky. <laughs> and I'm like, why would you say it's lucky that he... Wajun is not matched and Mulan's like what and he's like well how do you even begin to know how to talk to a woman and Mulan's like well you just talk to them like you're talking to me right now and he's like yeah if only it would be that easy and I'm like because you're gay <laughs> and then he like leans in really close and then suggests that Mulan go bathe and it's been a running joke that she refuses to bathe for obvious reasons so it, like they've been commenting on how she stinks but like right then and there, he's just said, oh, it's lucky that you're not matched. And like, I don't know how to talk to women. And like, you should go bathe. <laughs> I'm like, you're like super coming on to Wajun. <laughs> Pretty sure you're into him. And later when Mulan is in the lake actually bathing, 
not Shang finds her and like she's like go away and he's like nope strips goes right into the lake with her and he's like glad I found you he literally says glad I found you and I'm like you're definitely gay so like I don't know what Disney was where they were going with that because then later when Mulan is outed he's still into her and he like he doesn't kiss her ever but it's like you know he's like into her and before she leaves the imperial city he's like you know has a moment with her and he's the one that defends her later to the commander he's like you know you believe Wajun why is Mulan any different which oh also pissed me off that is a line that they stole from Mulan because here they split Shang into two people so like not the young not Shang turns to the old not Shang and is like you believed Wajun, why wouldn't you believe Wa Mulan? Which is literally a line that Mulan says to Shang in the animated one. She's the one that speaks up for herself. She says, you know, you believed Ping, why is Mulan different? She says that and it's so much more empowering when she says it. But nope, someone else had to say it for her and it was not Shang. Okay, I think that does it. Um, this is a really long video. It might even be as long as the movie itself. <laughs> It's such a bad movie. Nothing makes sense. Everything is awful. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. So if you're worried about not supporting Disney, but you're like, man, I really wish I could have seen Mulan, but I can't because I'm boycotting it. You're not missing out. It is, it is a dumpster fire. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below how you feel about Mulan. How you feel about this review? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let me know all the things. And I'll see you when I see you.